partially and then partially covered with the Joshua and the Yucca of the desert. The mountains uh, due to the east rise up to about 6,500 feet. Over to the north, the highest peak ranges rise to about 8,600 feet at the highest point. They taper down to the northwest at approximately 7,500 feet and then uh, in a slower and more evenly declined uh, region through the far west and down around the south. The actual bomb run will possibly be made from the north to the south, although we do not know that definitely at the moment. The planes in just a few moments will make their second run over this area. They already have made one pass. Uh, we trust that when they come, flying at their great altitude, you will notice their vapor trails. The lead plane is a B-50, and uh, it will drop the bomb. The three planes behind it are also B-50s, and they carry camera and measuring apparatus of the Atomic Energy Commission and of the Air Force. The correspondents here are located from all parts of the country, from virtually every state. There are governors from many states and the top officials. All of them are located around this uh, newsman's uh, knob, as it's called here, on the very basin. And directly behind us are the major control stations of the Atomic Energy Commission. Far down at the end of the basin are several towers, which we trust that before this telecast is concluded, we might be able to show you. These are the towers that are used for so-called ground drop. When the uh, atom bomb is placed in the tower and allowed to come down a shaft-like affair and thereby detonated at exact distances above the ground. Today's will be an airdrop. The size of the bomb, we have learned after talking to the atomic energy officials and a series of briefings that have taken the newsmen and the press and radio correspondents television correspondents over these areas for about four days and preparing for this great event. The bomb will be of the same nominal size, the officials say, as the bombs used at Bikini, at Hiroshima, and uh, at Nagasaki. However, it will be of greater energy proportions, which means when you break that down, it will be a bomb field. The bombs may be the same size, but of course, weather of various kinds can make the blast uh, increase proportions or decrease proportions. If it is a cloudy day, the clouds tend to absorb some of the uh, actual sound waves and uh, thereby diminishing the effect upon the ground. The blast waves that uh, crash into the ground when they go into the clouds, actually only one one millionth percent is then uh, reverberated back to the ground and therefore the clouds act as a blotter. But today it's a brilliantly clear, warm, and perfect day for uh, any kind of a test here at Nevada. For the past three days, we were in great apprehension because the days were cloudy, we've had rain, and we've had wind. They do not want wind for such a test. They do not want rain. They do not want clouds. Today, they have none, and it's a magnificent day. Cameras are grinding all around us with the newsmen and newsreels and awaiting now for the run, which approximately should come. The, the next pass over the area may come in approximately 15 or uh, 10 seconds. Actually, the H time is 9.30 Pacific Standard Time, and actually now it's around 9.18 in the last report that we had, and we will keep uh, receiving reports from Dr. Galen Feld of the Atomic Energy Commission, who breaks in to advise the viewers here exactly the status of, of affairs, and when he makes his next report, you no doubt will hear that. He uh, counts off the minutes before the actual drop time, the location of the planes, and uh, uh, keeps everyone well uh, advised on the status of the weather and all the, the details that they actually need to know. We're glancing off to the left at that moment to see if we could uh, visualize some planes coming over, but they have not yet come over the northern range if they're coming from that end, and uh, that is the area that we expect they'll come from, although they have made passes from both uh, directions in the past. They make them in each direction and at varying altitudes in the original test to gain exactly what they need for wind and weather conditions. This will be a visual drop. will have to be a visual with the bombardier dropping into a target on the bomb site, and the bomb site is at the extreme northeastern end of Yucca Flat at this moment. It's at the extreme northeastern end, and uh, to us here it looks like uh, some sort of a makeshift runway. The target is a, an approximate 700-foot affair that is circled in 
of black and white rings so if the uh, bombardier will have a perfect target to fire into and therefore he must make all of his compilations and then drop the bomb in visual contact. The troops have gone into the forward areas and have been there for some time. There are approximately a thousand troops that will be used and also a very interesting sidelight is that as soon as the bomb has been dropped there are four uh, C-46 planes located uh, far back at the uh, southern end of the range, and it is upon these planes that paratroopers will embark to then take a flight over the area and drop in as the secondary movement. The first movement will be the Army ground forces who will move out of foxholes four and a half to five feet deep and move into the area, and the secondary crowd will be the paratroopers who will then go over. This will test the actual effects. All of the viewers here, and this is the closest, by the way, that any uh, information media viewers have ever been allowed. There have been, of course, scientific viewers closer than we, but we are the closest of all of the press, the outside uh, so-called non-cleared uh, members who are not in the scientific field. All have been given special dark glasses, very black glasses indeed. If we put them on now and look at the sun, it looks uh, something like the moon shining at the height of midnight. These are the glasses which we must wear at approximately the uh, time the bomb is dropping for about three seconds afterwards because at the immediate flash, it is so bright, uh, nothing is seen at all, and it can uh, definitely harm and uh, hinder eyesight to the naked eye. What you may see when this bomb flash goes off, we don't know. It may be so bright as to burn out a camera tube. It may be so bright as to just be a momentary flash. Uh, when the sound waves strike, Actually, it may disrupt our signal. We are uh, surmising that you will see a quick flash and then quickly develop into a round fireball and then into the varying colors, and we will describe the colors for you. We will assume that you can see the uh, proportions that this uh, cloud and flash will take, and therefore we'll merely fill you in on the colors. The press crew here come from varying distances and have worked very hard. We have gone through, as we said before, about four days of briefings. We've been over this entire site. We've been through places that no other uh, outsiders have ever viewed and have found it all extremely informative and interesting and actually not too technical. Right uh, at that moment while we paused, Dr. Galen Felt uh, was announcing to the press assembled here about the goggles and to prepare to put them on in just a few moments. The H time now is approximately eight minutes away, and that was the announcement made to advise the press to at least have the goggles handy. If you don't have the black goggles, of course, you must turn away from the actual blast because, uh, as we said before, the first immediate flash is... Uh, of such a nature that would definitely injure the eyes. Right now, while everything has been set up previously up to this particular moment, on clock-like efficiency with the machinery handling everything, now as we understand it, the actual time of the drop is in the hands of the bombardier. If they make a pass over the area and decide that they do not want to drop the bomb, the plane then will turn about and make a run, a second pass, which will take an approximate 20 minutes. And for each ensuing pass, there may be 20 more minutes. All is surmised, however, that they will drop the bomb on the first run. The plane is a B-50, as we said, and it comes from Kirkland Airfield at Albuquerque, New Mexico. The troops that are in this area and the Air Force and the paratroopers are taken from areas all over the United States. The Air Force supporting group comes from Clovis Field in New Mexico. The Army troops come from uh, Indiana, they come from Alabama, from Colorado, and varying other states, and we probably will give you those units 
uh, right after the bomb dropped. Uh, Dr. Felt, just announcing to the audience here now, the press representatives, the information that we gave you previously about the bomb run at approximately uh, 3,500 feet. It'll be uh, between 32 and 3,500 feet uh, when actually it drops the bomb. And it will drop the bomb into a target, as we said, some 10 miles away. We expect here to receive the shock wave approximately uh, 45 seconds after the flash. If we happen to see it. Uh, Dr. Fell is announcing more of the plane positions. And we'll now wait here for the actual appearance of the planes. While we're waiting, uh, one plane, as we do see now, is uh, here. There they all come, actually. Coming now, going uh, from actually southwest to northeast. And here, uh, Grant, do you want to come in? Grant Holcomb has been standing by one of our other microphones and comes to this mountain peak here. For a moment, Grant, do you want to put in a few very important words? Because in just a moment, the hour will be here. Well, thank you, Fred. I just got out to the top of this mountain. I don't know what you've been talking about for the last few moments, but uh, 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 it was announced that the, the plane that will drop the bomb is at 36,000 feet. I don't know, know whether I... When the bomb will drop, and we give you a bomb's away, We'll count off approximately 20 seconds after bombs away. And then there's going to be this tremendous blinding flash that will, in all probability, whiten up the television screen. Now, all of us here have extremely dark glasses, 0.4 approximately three seconds after the blinding flash. And that, uh, as I said, will certainly whiten up your television screen. But those of you at home will certainly not have to put on dark glasses or anything at all because there is certainly no danger of, uh, of uh, slight radiation uh, uh, blindness, which is a momentary thing, but uh, it gets to be a very uncomfortable thing because uh, you have uh, not only the, the radiation aspect, but, uh, but the tremendous heat. Ah, just a minute. You will hear the bombs away, then the blinding flash, followed by a cloud. Now, here's Fred Henry. We're at an interesting point as an ice cap will form on top of this uh, cloud as it goes billowing up uh, higher and higher. It came, as you saw, as a great flash with about 10 parallel white, almost vapor trails along the horizontal on its left side. It then exploded into uh, not the flashy uh, red, brilliant red that we had uh, been led to believe, but it just seemed to hover there for a moment. And then it went up, and now it is pouring into the, uh, like a donut, completely uh, unfolding itself, a huge uh, puff on a pipe almost. And the red and the brown is now tumbling under as white smoke comes down from the top, and the dust across this entire uh, basin goes uh, up almost like a battleship. And it looks very much like there's a battleship in this basin with a huge uh, white smoke trail above it, and then it's tremendous donut up there that goes higher and higher. It's an absolutely a fabulous sight. Fred, just looking away from the beautiful mushroom that's turning into that fabulous white now, and down to that ugly gray all across the floor of this valley, you can't help but realize that you could put right inside this proving ground from where we are, the entire island of Manhattan, New York City. And if you look at that dirty, ugly, gray base, you see what that particular weapon can do. And certainly, as we've been told here many times during the past few days by Mr. Gordon Dean, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, General Joseph Mills, 
who is in charge of the airdrop today, the enemy certainly has similar weapons. Beautiful white cloud and a clear blue sky, dirty gray bottom, the proving ground. Fred, have you anything you'd like to say? Uh, Grad, just on top, if we look here now with some very powerful binoculars, and maybe our camera far away up Mount Charleston will have this because they're further and higher than, of course, we are. And that is that there's a very sleek uh, ice cap right on top. As we said, there was a, a, the, a mushroom effect has now changed to a flat top, and it's uh, almost like an ice skating rink, uh, very smooth and even. The feeling that I had, Grant, is the same as you mentioned a moment ago about the feeling that we could put all of Manhattan in here and the potency of this bomb. Actually, when you see this go off and feel the uh, wave and hear the great explosion, and certainly this one was felt and heard, I think we looked with so much humility upon this awesome force that has been created by man. This has gone higher now, tremendous height, it's mushrooming out, and now there's almost a vapor trail on top of that white cap. It's all, the entire top is all white. The shaft, the middle shaft is, I would say, uh, two-thirds white with a little bit of uh, yellow, uh, orangish yellow along one side, and then, of course, the uh, gray at the bottom here as the uh, dust uh, goes up into that. Right now, in a few moments, Grant, I think the, the radiation uh, advanced group will go off, won't they, and we'll see when the troops can go into action. Uh, yes, Fred, uh, I, I just had the glasses on them, and they're moving forward now. These, uh, This is what uh, they call uh, RAD safe, uh, radiological safety. Uh, these are men who walk through with uh, Geiger counters and uh, similar instruments to detect uh, the amount of radiation in the area from uh, at uh, the fringe of ground zero point. They're certainly on the fringe of that now. Uh, the troops are, we don't know. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, the military, uh, will not say how close they were to where the bomb was dropped. But it has been guessed and rumored among the correspondents uh, here today, and uh, when I say rumor, I want to emphasize that, that they are between seven and eight miles away from where the bomb was dropped. Now, that is only a rumor. It's quite possible that they could be closer. This we do know for a fact. They are the closest any human beings have ever been in a military maneuver to a bomb drop. Of course, the only persons who were horribly and dreadfully closer were those in Japan. But these troops are the closest any of our troops have ever been to an atomic bomb drop. And now, in a little while, just to give you a slight picture of the military maneuver, it's uh, in the drop. Well, proceed slowly. First, the uh, RAD safety people go ahead detecting the amount of uh, radiological material. Uh, when it is safe for them to advance into the ground zero area where the bomb was dropped, they will move forward. And then, weather permitting, and uh, when I say weather in this instance, I mean the day's winds, Paratroopers will take off in four planes and drop in back of the bomb. Uh, the idea being for the advancing ground forces to join up with the paratroopers in the ground zero zone and take the theoretical objective that was there. Grant, I just want to break in just a moment. We've now moved in previously up to now. We've been viewing this from our uh, cameras at Mount Charleston. We have now moved into our uh, cameras located right here on the range itself, and our close-up cameras. And of course, we now be able to get a very close view of exactly what is going to happen with the paratroopers about to depart uh, after the ground uh, zero time is declared safe. I think there's one thing that uh, should be mentioned as far as the uh, troop operation is concerned, that they were in one location in their foxholes. They, they then uh, were to advance into the second area, one area immediately 
ahead of them. Right now, I believe you can see some of the planes going up here. There's a C-46 going in, a, in advance, taxiing up at the end of this a long uh, desert area, and that is no doubt going to go out and make some of the first radiological tests. Now, these planes go out first. The, uh, this is the C-47 up there that is now going at the far end, an Army Air Force plane, and it no doubt will make some of the first cloud samplings. After the initial cloud samplings are made, and the ground forces make some of their tests, of uh, both the Atomic Energy Commission and the uh, Army Medical Corps, then will be determined at what point the area is radiologically uh, safe enough for uh, the troops to make their movement. The actual operation here with regard to the troops, as Grant started to mention, and Grant now, uh, who has been up here on top of this peak where I am located, has now gone down this peak and is going down to a lower camera. Right now, you can look at the mushrooming effect that you see. It's gone higher. Now the shaft connected between the ground and the actual uh, mushroom itself is entirely disintegrated, and we have two sections. High above, spreading out in a great blanket now. It has started as a mushroom, it then went as a uh, donut, all in white, an unfolding donut, and now it is beginning to spread out into an umbrella shape. And the dust cloud, which had gone up almost in the form of a huge battleship, then with a high a uh, shaft on top of that. Now it's beginning to uh, flatten out and is almost a rectangular affair. There's a great uh, gap between the uh, lower area here where the dust cloud is and the higher area where the actual uh, atomic uh, blast, the bomb itself, the bright orange flame, which then turned to brown and a reddish brown and uh, then into the brilliant white. The greatest thing that strikes us with color here was not the uh, actual color, it was the whiteness of the white. I can't recall whenever I have seen any white as white as the uh, top mushroom effect when it came onto the ice cap. And certainly it was also a very interesting and thrilling note to watch the upper layer of the cloud formation itself and the ice formed, uh, the brilliance and the smoothness of it. Those are the two things that impressed us, the whiteness of this cloud as it started to go up, and then the smooth brilliance of the ice formation on top. Uh, right now, at the far end of the uh, Yucca Flat here, we see some dust formations, and those are the Army trucks, the advanced Army trucks that are beginning to move from their assembled formation, their assembled areas, assembly areas, and move in formation up toward some of the front line uh, regions. The actual movement will probably take some time because they will make uh, one advance and then have the forward area, of course, go into uh, uh, checking for radiological counts. The dust formation now is almost obscuring the entire northern mountain range. And as we told you, the mountain range at the north is something like 8,000. In fact, it is exactly 8,605 feet. And the uh, dust cloud certainly is five times above that at the moment, four times at least. And of course, the actual uh, bomb blast itself, which is now drifting from the target area. It is coming now, uh, drifting with the wind, blowing it to the south over. It's not exactly over our head. It's to our right, to the east and it's uh, coming uh, as it continually spreads out, not exactly an umbrella formation, almost like a huge blanket. The marine planes are beginning to come down here at our far right, and soon they will take the troops there. Reaction here, of course, was some silence. Oh, while this uh, went off, and they reacted now, of course, uh, the reactions were many. Some here had seen previous blasts of Bikini, some like uh, William L. Lawrence of the New York Times, and we had the privilege to interview on a television program last night, of course, as a veteran. Uh, Grant Holcomb is now down with another uh, camera actually on the uh, lower area, we are high, so let's switch down to Grant Holcomb and our camera low. Go ahead, Grant Holcomb. Now this is uh, Grant Holcomb at the bottom of uh, what has become...
reporters from the news associations, from the magazines, radio stations, television stations in the United States. News knob, directly at the sun, it doesn't bother me at all. It's just a, just a street light. And another thing that I think a few of you people might be interested in here uh, is why this place is called Yucca Flat. Now, all of this business that you see around us are, are yucca trees. The place is literally covered with uh, covered with yucca trees. And uh, although it isn't apparent in this uh, in this uh, area, approximately eight million dollars has been spent underground and uh, in a few visible aspects in and among all of these weird desert trees, some of the oldest trees and known to mankind. About eight and a half million dollars in this tremendous proving ground. I think you can probably get a little better view of the entire area and see just what there is here and what there isn't here, what there isn't apparent from uh, in front of us right now. You can see the parked airplanes of the Marine Corps. Uh, there are four of them, four C-46s. Uh, that, that will be uh, taking off in just a moment. An interesting point on these uh, paratroopers who will be soon making their jump. There are uh, two interesting officers on board. Uh, one of them is a lieutenant who is one of the six, I believe, uh, jumping dentists, and another is uh, a chaplain. So on board of the uh, Marine paratrooper, rather the Army, the paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne Division who are jumping here, uh, one of them uh, will be a jumping dentist, and the other will be a chaplain. Right now, far the advanced units that have gone out to test radiological effects and are coming back to make their uh, uh, reports. Uh, the truck's coming in right now. The radiological trucks, that, uh, the two lead cars have gone through, but the trucks actually contain the paratroopers. Well, these will be the men of the 82nd Airborne that will come in on these trucks and will come up and... Uh, uh, embark on the planes to make their parachute dr jump. So evidently, the area has been declared safe. A fire engine is now going along the road to our left, and it very often happens in an atom bomb flash. Sometimes telephone poles and things along the line catch on fire. They are not visible here at all. The trucks now are coming down uh, behind the parked planes, and the paratroopers will soon get out. And there are about 120, actually, 120 of these members of the 82nd Airborne who will make this parachute jump in uh, to this area. And try attempting now to put our binoculars on and see what we can determine. Uh, there are approximately uh, eight trucks that have come through now are filled, and these paratroopers will soon get out, will uh, line up in front of the are now. No doubt you can see several of the lines of them as they are now going to the first plane, plane number one, which is at the extreme uh, southwestern end of this lineup. The paratrooper is coming into position. The dust cloud now, for the first time, we can actually see across the uh, flat where the bomb uh, area had been, uh, the bomb blast where ground zero was. We can see at the far edge now of the mountains, the very, very low, uh, I don't know if you can see this at the moment because the dust is still in some areas, but we can see a very thin pencil uh, line almost of the very base of the uh, mountain. More of the paratrooper trucks are coming in. The whole group is now completely assembled. The final truck's coming up. Uh, we are awaiting some report on the radiological tests and when uh, the troops can actually advance into their area. The press crew, of course, those that have the cameras are, are very, very well occupied and the uh, newspaper men actually are uh, beginning to file their stories. Now on at our lower camera on the basin here at the Yucca Flats. Well, uh, I've been standing here with uh, Mr. Millard Caldwell, the uh, Federal Director of Civilian Defense. We've been watching the paratroopers load into their planes and getting in preparation for the jump. Mr. Caldwell, as you know, is the Director of Civilian Defense, a former governor of Florida, and like all of you this morning, uh, he witnessed in person his first atomic bomb. Mr. Caldwell, uh, last night you told me that uh, 
The civil defense program hadn't been going very well, but sometime around 9.45 Pacific Standard Time this morning that you thought there would be a great impetus and surge of uh, people wanting to work in civilian defense organizations. Do you still feel that after watching what we've seen this morning? More strongly than I did last night. Every, every person who saw this on your television show this morning is right now ready to do something about civil defense. And that applies to the people from the top to the bottom, the officialism as well as private citizens. Well, Mr. Caldwell, what specifically is your need in civilian defense at the moment? What are your problems? A mental approach to this problem that's calm, realistic, and willing to learn to do those things necessary to keep this democracy of ours alive. Well, I think we certainly saw a considerable amount of calmness this morning from uh, the troops that we have, uh, uh, the troops that we had uh, out there uh, close to the blast. Uh, we had a report from uh, a command post there a few moments ago that uh, uh, there was a considerable amount of dust out there and a much stronger blast wave that we felt, but uh, so far but they have reported that uh, no one was injured or in any way damaged. The troops were up out of their hole, and that certainly is uh, a demonstration, I believe, of what you said. Ladies and gentlemen, you have for the past 55 minutes watched the telecast from Yucca Flats out on the Nevada desert. I'm sure you, that uh, you felt the same frustration we here in the studio did when the picture broke up. I'm sure that many of you thought that perhaps your own television sets were out of order. That wasn't the case. The men of television in the, the California area had set up in a very valiant try. And as a matter of fact, a great deal of it was really thrilling. I'm sure that you did see a portion of the atomic explosion and the big cloud afterward. Anyway, the, tr the situation was that they had had to set up for a period of 300 miles uh, portable microwave uh, recorders to uh, push the signal along. Something just uh, got a little bit haywire. It didn't work as well as it might have, but at least it was a first at uh, an actual coast-to-coast -coast television uh, broadcast of the explosion of an atomic bomb. You saw a little bit of what went on before the explosion and uh, some of the aftermath, too. And now, here is a special film produced by the Civilian Defense uh, by way of a reminder that not only the United States has the atomic bomb, but that the civil defense is everybody's business. For an air raid alert, three minutes of short blasts on horns or on whistles or a three-minute wailing siren. Go at once to your shelter area. If you are in your...